Okay, thank you. Um, so this talk is about GNU Taler and how to do secure web payments with it. So GNU Taler is a currently research project being developed at INRIA, which is a French national research institution. And it's also part of the GNU project, so it's completely free and open source software. So I, can, I think we can all agree in this room that modern economies need some form of currency. Uh, one form of currency is cash, but as you've noticed recently in India, um, there are quite a few problems with cash, mainly uh, revolving around uh, illegitimate uses. And also in our lives where more and more things are becoming digital, uh, it's very cumbersome to have, like, uh, printed cash notes. So what is the solution for that? Maybe credit or debit cards? Um, I think the answer would be no. Because for uh, credit and debit card companies, they're mostly controlled by like a oligopoly of very few big and foreign companies, if we look at the chart. Uh, so for credit cards, it's mostly Visa, MasterCard, UnionPay, and other big American companies. And for debit cards, it's even worse. So this can result in quite high fees because only a few companies are in control of the infrastructure. And also uh, credit card payments are really cumbersome and expensive, especially if you're doing small and frequent online transaction. So let's say you want to pay a journalist who wrote an article and purchase it. Um, it's really cumbersome if every time you want to do this, you need to do some two-factor authentication and type in some number from your mobile phone. And also, this is especially relevant for merchants, uh, are the false positives on fraud detection. Mm, so when a customer that has uh, money and wants to buy something in your shop, but their credit card company uh, thinks due to some heuristic, maybe because you're in another country, that this is a fraud and they deny the customer, uh, this really frustrates them and might drive them away from your shop. So uh, we've just seen a whole talk about Bitcoin. It's this completely unregulated payment system that kind of originates from uh, the uh, like the crypto anarchist community and its lack of regulation is basically the main feature. One thing that I personally really like about it is that it's implemented completely in free software and it's a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer system. And the problem that it solves is uh, the Byzantine fault tolerant agreement on this transaction ledger as we've just heard. And the creative solution that Bitcoin uses for it is that it ties the distribution of money and the creation of new nodes to solving this consensus problem on the ledger. Uh, as we just heard, you need to compute a computational puzzle on the set of the new transactions that you want to commit to the ledger. And then the node who finds this puzzle first gets rewarded with a, a mining fee. Uh, but in my opinion, this just results on a, in a slow and very expensive banking system. Uh, so I actually have numbers to support this claim. This is the blockchain.info site, which just collects data and computes statistics on the publicly available blockchain, so everyone can uh, verify this data. And currently, the cost for one Bitcoin transaction is around seven US dollars. Uh, this is for one transaction. So uh, at first, it sounds like this contradicts the data that was given in the previous talk, but it actually doesn't. Mm. Because in this case, the customer who buys something with Bitcoin pays a uh, relatively low fee, just a few cents in US dollars. Uh, but the cost for the whole system is much higher because the reward that the miners get is the some of the individual transaction fees of the block plus this mining fee for the whole block. So if you add all that together and divide it by the number of transactions in a block, you actually get to this currently seven US dollars. And in my opinion, this is not a way to uh, 
run a uh, stable financial system if every single transaction costs the whole system seven dollars or sometimes up to 16 or in, in good cases if you're lucky like four dollars and also the transaction rate which is plotted here uh, is not really usable for really consumer transactions like here it's six transactions per second or even only two compared to uh, other systems like Visa that handles uh, thousands of transactions even per second and uh, also another indication why Bitcoin isn't really usable for the end user at all is that the current transaction value is 1,000 US dollars. And this means that most people are using Bitcoin to transfer really large amounts of money, but they're not using it to buy ice cream or lunch. And another disadvantage of Bitcoin is that all transactions that you make are public and uh, linkable back to your identity eventually. And uh, this means it's not privacy friendly at all. And some researchers have done lots of very interesting work on making Bitcoin more privacy friendly, which resulted in systems like uh, Zero Cash, which are really, really good in the privacy aspects, but unfortunately they're even more expensive and they're even slower. And the next question is, are we as a society really ready for a system where we can do completely hidden bank transactions? It's basically going back to the old system of cash even with less, fewer opportunities for regulations. And I don't think that we should build on such systems. So GNU Thaler is our counter proposal to the current state of payment systems. Uh, the tagline is digital cash made socially responsible. Thaler is actually an acronym. It stands for taxable anonymous Libre electronic reserves. So for us taxable means that at least the income of merchants is uh, visible and auditable by the government and thus it can be taxable. Anonymous on the other hand only applies to the customer or the citizen who uh, can do payments without having to authenticate. This is not only very important for the user's privacy but also for security reasons because this means that you don't need to use an authentication system that has potential security issues. And of course you want such a system to be practical so it should be fast and electronic and resource friendly. So we don't want to do these huge proof of work calculations that eat a, up a lot of energy. And uh, another aspect is this Libre, which means that it should be completely free and open source. And this sounds minor, but in my opinion is something that's very important because payment infrastructure is something that's so important that it should be that it should be a commons. So um, we've heard this in a previous talk that it would be nice to have free and open source software infrastructure that really everybody with enough technical abilities or so countries, organizations, or in some cases even individuals uh, could run and review. Of course, uh, unlike Bitcoin, uh, in our system there are still government restrictions that apply. So of course, people who run it need to uh, comply with the respective regulation. And the system is designed in such a way that can be run on top of existing legacy bank infrastructure, for example in Europe SEPA, or you could run it on UPI in India. This is the basic architecture, so there's this triangle between the customer, merchant, and the exchange. The exchange, in this case, is something like a payment service provider. So when the customer wants to get uh, digital coins, they send a payment from their bank account to the exchange and receive coins for it. And these coins are withdrawn with a protocol that uses blind signatures, so they're not anymore with the customer once they're spent with the merchant. So the customer sends those coins to the merchant, um, the merchant deposits those coins again at the exchange, gets reimbursed for them by a normal bank transfer, and the customer gets their product. And in this system, of course, the exchange serves as an escrow 
and we need to ensure that it's actually operating correctly. So another component in the system is the auditor, which allows governments or regulatory bodies to run completely automated audits on the database of the exchange and verify that it didn't embezzle any funds or move any money somewhere where it shouldn't go. And uh, now for the exciting part, uh, this is not just theory, we've actually implemented the system and I'm going to do the demo now, but on a laptop that is not mine, so something could go wrong, bear with me. We go to demo.taler.net. By the way, everybody here in the audience with a uh, relatively recent version of Google Chrome uh, can try this. So the first step is to go to our wallet installation page and install our wallet. This should just take one click. You now have to wait for the download and yeah, this button appears. This is our extension. Now we can go back. And now the first step is to uh, withdraw funds from your bank account into your wallet. And for this demo, of course, we need some form of example bank account. So you've implemented like a uh, very simple demo bank that just uses a non-existing currency called kudos instead of like euros or rupees. And let's register with uh, 50p. Now, if this bank account, we have 100 kudos as a starting bonus, and we can withdraw some amount from that into our wallet. Um, here, the exchange provider gets some fees in order to pay for running the infrastructure. You can accept those fees, and then here, in uh, with a normal bank, you would receive like some kind of. Uh, pin tan thing or you would use second factor authentication, you would just have some step where the user needs to enter a captcha. And now this wheel should spin and we have our coins in our bank in, in our wallet withdrawn from our bank account into the local wallet that runs in the browser. And now we can go to our site again. and go to a merchant that actually accepts Taler payments. This is a very simple store that just has a list of essays that are normally uh, freely available, but uh, for demo purposes, we offer them for a QDIS payment. So we click for the, uh, on them, and now the wallet in a different security context uh, prompts for confirmation with 0.1 QDIS. You can click confirm, and now I can read the article. So this was the demo, and of course our balance decreased. Okay, so what is the advantage of such system? What is the value for the customer? Uh, as you've just seen, it's very convenient. It's just one-click payments once you have the um, balance in your wallet. And it's also a guaranteed payment. So once the money is in your wallet, there's no fraud detection mechanism that can prevent your customers from uh, actually getting through the payment step. Mm, and it's secure, so unlike cash, you don't need to worry about uh, counterfeit or something like that. And it's privacy preserving, so uh, you don't even need to log in and the payment doesn't require any uh, personal information to be entered. Uh, so this does away with this authentication step that is a potential security issue. And uh, by design of the system, the privacy still holds, uh, even when we are in legislations where the government mandates weakened encryption. Because we're using blind signatures and no encryption, even if the encryption is weakened, the privacy aspect still holds. And as Taler is always bound to some existing currency, uh, unlike Bitcoin, which is a completely new currency, there's no additional fluctuation. So of course you still have the fluctuation that you have yeah.
Um, yeah. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. Let's continue. Um, so it's uh, always bound to some existing currency and some existing financial system. And the wallet we've just seen is uh, completely free software. So there's no hidden things in there that might sell your information to some other party. And uh, other parties can verify that this functionality is correctly implemented. And uh, for the merchants, uh, as you've just seen, uh, the transactions are very fast. So it's not like in Bitcoin where you need to wait 10 minutes to get a transaction. It's free software, which means that you have a competitive pricing and support model. And the fees are quite low due to the efficient protocol that we use and the absence of fraud detection. Um, and uh, as it's not bound to any uh, specific currency, you can do payments in any currency and with any amount. Um, I'm, so with Bitcoin, uh, in the past, it has often been used for illegitimate purposes, like buying drugs on Tor or something. And so uh, here we don't have the risk uh, of being associated with illegal businesses because due to the whole auditing that's going on, it's much harder to actually use Taller for illegitimate businesses like selling drugs. And um, from a security perspective, it's uh, very good for the merchant because they don't need to store or process any sensitive customer data. And that makes it very easy to comply with uh, data, reg data minimization regulations. Like for example, the recent um, regulations that were passed in the EU um, that uh, legally mandate some form of data minimization. And for the government, as I mentioned earlier, it's free software, so it's a commons, and there's no need to worry about some uh, foreign company taking over your economy. And it's, uh, of course, uh, much easier to do something against uh, illegitimate payments than it is with cash or with uh, zero cash, for example. And, of course, uh, efficient payments are always good for the economy. And with these automated audits, you can also ensure that the exchanges are uh, operating correctly in an automated way. And the privacy aspect means that foreign governments can uh, spy into your transaction system, uh, like it actually has happened in the past uh, with uh, SWIFT and the NSA espionage. Okay, so now we've seen the uh, high-level overview. Let's dive a bit into the technical aspects of the system. Um, this is actually the expanded architecture, you, so you can still see the basic triangle in the bottom with the customer, the exchange, and the merchant. Mm, but now they're actually all connected to the banking system. So these three banks might be in practice actually be the same bank, but here, just for completeness in the diagram, they're different entities. Or um, the customer's bank might often be actually associated with the exchange, um, just like in our case, which makes it very, very easy to uh, withdraw cash into your wallet. And yeah, um, the customer is split into the browser and the wallet extension, which runs in a separate security context. For the merchant, you have your typical architecture, some front end, some order processing system, and then the Tower SDK, which connects to the Tower backend, uh, which is a component that transparently implements all the cryptography and could either run uh, on premise with a merchant or be some cloud service. Um, we have some APIs that allow you to do the web integration. So a very simple starting example would be detecting whether a wallet is present or not. So it's just a simple JavaScript API. The actual payments on a technical level are handled through HTTP status code. So the merchant would send a 402 payment required for the article uh, with some URL that specifies where to get the uh, digitally signed contract uh, to pay for this article. And the wallet then acts on it. So this is an example of how a contract could look like. Uh, you can see this is an example contract for uh, the essay store. Like there's in the list of project, there's the essay that you would get. 
Um, so on a technical level, uh, it uses relatively proven and uh, well-known cryptography. Uh, but of course, modern instantiation for, uh, of them. So it's not like in zero cache where it's very experimental protocols where people are sometimes not even sure if they actually work or not, but it's very proven protocols. Um, compared with uh, other payment solutions, um, one thing is that in GNU Tower you always have to be online. So the merchant, the exchange, and the customer always have to communicate. Um, but uh, we do have very low transaction cost and uh, very high speed. We can uh, guarantee that income of merchants can be taxed. And while the uh, income of the uh, merchant is known, the payer can be anonymous. And uh, from a security perspective, I mentioned that before, uh, because there's no authentication required. Uh, from the user's perspective, it's uh, quite secure because you're not prone anymore to things like phishing attacks where you can uh, accidentally enter authentication information on the wrong page. Um, and of course, it's free and open source software, so everybody can audit and deploy it. So current development that we're doing is uh, we're still improving the user interface of the wallet and some internal things. Uh, we're working on the auditing for the exchange and we're writing tutorials uh, for merchants on how to actually integrate Teller with their web shops. And we're looking into making better marketing materials and explanations for people who are not technical. I mean, this originated from a research project and now we're trying to get more traction on the business side of it. Okay, so what can you do? So you can, of course, tell people about Tyler. If you are a developer, you can read the documentation and give us feedback and maybe see how Tyler would integrate into your workshop. If you're really crazy, you can try to get a banking license and run an exchange in your legis legislation. And you can always talk to us on the GNUnet IRC, which is like the uh, umbrella or sister project to Tyler, and yeah, talk to us on there. So um, to conclude, uh, what are the options for the future of payment systems? Either we can uh, keep uh, using credit cards where uh, like mass surveillance is possible and it's just controlled by a few uh, huge US companies, or we can really engage in this arms race between uh, cryptographers and smarter surveillance and blockchain-based technologies. Uh, we can enjoy the in course, benefits of cash, or, and this is of course uh, the solution that we're trying to work towards, uh, really establish a free software alternatives that uh, balances the social goals between, uh, on the one hand, enabling this taxation, and on the other hand, also um, being privacy friendly. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Florian. Um, we'll throw it up for a few questions. Uh, can we start with one here? Just a second, we'll get to the mic. Yeah, thank you, Fabian. Uh, I'm Kaushik. Kind of a longish question. I'll try to sort of make sense of it in about 15 seconds into it. One of the things that caught my eye was when you said social and also taxation. Uh, typically, how you do taxes is you file taxes, you self audit them, you submit to the government, and then there's pen penalties for not being able to file them on time or not being able to file them, right? Even with that, even in spite of all that, there's inconsistencies with how you file tax. Now, when you have an Orwellian system looking at you, a centralized surveillance system, I'm guessing your taxation is automatic, right? Because you said... Um, yeah, I, I think I'm, I understand where you're trying to get it. Thanks yeah. for the question. Um, so the point is we're not trying to replace any tax system. Um, we're just trying to make it harder for merchants to hide their income. Of course, you would still keep the existing tax system everywhere. Um, but you as a government have uh, a better way to actually verify the income of merchants and that they 
didn't have any extra income, for example, with technologies like uh, Bitcoin, which make this very hard. So the point is just that it's easier for governments to know what the income of merchants is. But would it not rob people of uh, the idea of basic human property, of holding onto a property, of being able to do things? Uh, having a centralized system look into it, right? You, How do you uh, position yourself to sort of escape from the same kind of uh, frauds or cheese that I do when I file a tax offline? What if I do a multi-party settlement? What if I have multiple accounts, multiple remnants? You would still not be able to catch them, but you be able to... Again, so uh, the target audience for this uh, project is more real end-user payments, uh, like on digital devices, like your browser or your smartphone. Um, but uh, also in contrast to Bitcoin, we're not really trying to replace the other parts of the financial system or how things like taxation works. Uh, so Tyler always writes on top of these other systems. I can, uh, can okay, I add a point I, on that? Yeah. So if you, if you look at the crypto that they use, it makes it very hard to fake a transaction. Yeah. Uh, even if you do a refund, a refund is not a transaction. So it's something that is specifically counted for. How do you do a refund so that you can say that this is actually a refund and not a transaction? Now, UPA doesn't have that right now if yeah. you look at it, for instance. Yeah. Uh, in Tyler, it's actually very well designed. Right. And also, uh, sorry. Just one second. Maybe we'll get to the others and then you can come back to the oh, YC questions. was my question. We no, no, we'll, we'll get to the other question. If, we have, if there's some time, we'll get back to you. We can discuss this offline if you want yeah. to. I'm available oh, after the, the talk. So I have uh, two parts. One is uh, how is international payments handled, number one, and what's the adoption? Um, so for the second question, um, this is really like moving out of a research project to establishing a business. So of course the adoption is basically zero. Um, and for your first question, this is actually one of the pain points that we haven't really solved yet. Uh, so uh, for, I mean, international uh, payments are for us not really a use case right now. Yeah, uh, anybody? Yeah, there are two questions at the back there, and then I'll come to you. Can you send money to peers using Tala? Um, yes, there, there are two ways to do this. One of them, if it's like your friend or your wife and you really trust them, you could just share coins out of your wallet. Uh, first, this doesn't constitute a transaction because you need to trust the sender that they really deleted the coins out of their wallets and will not spend them before you get the chance to. So these things are, of course, not taxable. Just like if I share my complete bank account details with you, then you can make a transaction on my behalf without that being visible in the system. And what was the second part of your question? I think that was that was just the one part of the question. Uh, there's another question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a kind of continuation of his question because you did mention limitation is that when you want to transfer money to friends and family. Uh, why can't we incorporate that as a feature that, you know, I'm transferring money to my wife, so you kind of incorporate an additional feature that it's, you know, I know to whom I'm transferring. Okay, but the, my second question is on the blockchain part. I'm always having doubts. You said it's proof of stake or proof uh, of work. Proof of work, yeah. Proof of work. But proof of work, isn't that a problem? Like, I don't know how many nodes are there in India who's doing proof of work kind of stuff. And if all the nodes are like centralized in one country, won't that kind of break down the whole blockchain technology? Yeah, I mean, I was basically arguing against the blockchain. So, um, uh, sorry if that didn't come through uh, with the presentation, but we're not relying on any blockchain technology. This was basically just a critique of blockchain. Yeah, there was a question. Yeah. Uh, can you shed some more light on uh, how exactly the blind signatures work? More on the privacy of uh, the client who's trying to pay money to the merchant? Um, so we use some additional things on top of blind signature, but basically how it works is um, you uh, create a um, serial number for your coin, you do some cryptographic uh, computation in order to blind this, you then send it to the exchange, they will sign it and say that it has a value, return it to you, and then you can unblind it. So it's a cryptographic protocol that allows some party to give exactly one signature and only one signature because otherwise you could create like an infinite supply of coins. Um, 
but on some data we don't know what that data is. So uh, you then have a just like a signed bank note, but the uh, bank only knows that it's signed one bank note, not what the serial number is. Yeah. Um, any for, uh, for so there's one question there. Um, so where is the record of these coins kept? Um, this is kept in, in the exchange, so we can go back to the architecture diagram. So in fact, uh, there's not one central exchange, but people who have the uh, required licenses in their uh, legislation can run an exchange. And there needs to be some trust between merchants and exchange and customer. And that is established by this auditing party that uh, certif certifies, certifies that this exchange is running correctly and is allowed to um, operate in the legislation that uh, this auditor is responsible for. So in real world, what kind of company would be an exchange? Um, for example, banks. So um, this would be the most obvious way uh, to just uh, have a bank uh, run uh, as an exchange. Okay. Um, do we have any, uh, that, any further questions? No? Okay, since we have a few minutes more, uh, if anybody has questions, Vivek, uh, if you could take uh, some more questions uh, for, say, both Vivek and Florian, uh, we could have those as well. We could have a discussion on the relative merits of blockchain versus Tala. Uh, yeah, sure, we can just. Yeah, hi, Vivek. Just, just mention whom you specifically. Yeah, for, this is for Vivek. Okay. So, um, isn't it ironic in India that Bitcoin or blockchain is an open network? Uh, it's an open source network and government does not uh, have any regulations on top of it. But whatever exchanges are there in India requires a KYC from anyone who is trying to buy or sell Bitcoins. Uh, we need to follow with... Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. We need to follow with the uh, compliance procedures in India because when we are touching fiat... That is where the actual, uh, we need to abide the rules and regulations of the Indian uh, government. As far as Bitcoin is concerned, if you are uh, purely using uh, Bitcoin for all your transactions, uh, and uh, because there is currently still no regulation that's being put out uh, by the RBI or any government entity as such on Bitcoin, there's just a warning to be very careful about using uh, Bitcoin because it's very new. Uh, that way it's like very hard to uh, comment on the specific uh, question that you asked. Yeah, uh, there's a question here. Hi, uh, this is just to build on what uh, Vivek said. Most of the uh, KYC is brought on by the exchanges to protect themselves. It's not a, it's not mandatory right now for them to do KYC as well. It's basically they're protecting themselves so that you know, in case there is a regulation that comes in, it is easier for them to just make sure that this is the trail and we're not doing something illegal. So that's just a protection mechanism employed by uh, exchanges right now. It's not compulsory. Just to add to it, uh, in terms of uh, regulations in other parts of the world that are being uh, uh, implemented on Bitcoin, US basically takes the lead in any kind of a technological innovation and uh, uh, they already have a license that says Bit license. And a lot of exchanges uh, continue to operate in US are fully compliant with the US uh, bit license, uh, which has been a regulatory uh, framework issued for Bitcoin. Uh, some of them, however, decided to move out of US just because they found that the uh, regulations or the norms set out for Bitcoin exchanges were a bit too much. So it's, it's, it depends on the uh, use cases and how governments want to uh, be open to this technology. Yeah, there was a question at the back there. Yeah. My question is for Florian. I work for Razorpay, which is a payments company. So what we do is we build technology on uh, banks and wallets on merchants' behalf so that they can easily accept payments. How would such a company fit into the Teller ecosystem? Um, I mean, one way would, uh, I mean, one path I could imagine is just them using Teller as the infrastructure with uh, their custom wallets on top of it. 
So that gives them those added privacy and security benefits that Tyler has, and also the benefit of being part of a, like, a common free and open software infrastructure uh, with their customizations added on top. Yeah, um, any further questions? Yeah, there's one here, just a sec. Thank you. Um, the question about Tyler, sorry if I missed this. Uh, so does a customer actually choose what exchange he deals with or is that completely um, hidden from the customer himself? And if there are actually multiple exchanges and not just a single exchange, then how do they kind of sync up and make sure you know the, the balance is same everywhere? Um, so per default, every currency has uh, in the wallet uh, a default exchange. But the user is actually free to change that and choose another exchange. So um, per default, of course, we uh, don't want the user to have to select one. But if they really care about that, they can do so that we can establish this ecosystem of exchanges. And if I do change my exchange after, say, five transactions, how, does the, how do the two exchanges make sure they're in sync? Um, right now, this is, this is kind of the same issue as for international payments. Uh, at least right now, we don't have any way to do this without uh, transferring back the coins into your normal bank account and just uh, getting uh, a wallet balance at another exchange. Okay. Any further questions? No, sorry. This is for Vivek. Uh, do we have any stat statistics of where are where are most of the where is the most of the mining being done today, or where are the biggest miners? Mining farm. Uh, uh, China basically owns uh, almost 40 to uh, 30 percent of the Bitcoin mining ecosystem because uh, Chinese government uh, decided uh, they are actually missing out on technology, and it's always like the uh, uh, cat mouse race. So what happens is uh, initially when Bitcoin was started off, the US was more uh, pro, uh, saw the biggest uh, uh, growth for Bitcoin and then came the European market <laughs> and China basically immediately that actually tried to uh, ban Bitcoin at one point. They did impose a uh, actual legal ban on Bitcoin, uh, but uh, due to the uh, revolt from the community, uh, the citizens of China and also a lot of other factors, economic uh, factors. Uh, Chinese government realized that uh, they are actually missing out on something big, as big as the internet. It's like uh, India uh, not being able to get uh, sufficient uh, IP addresses, IPv4, and uh, we are uh, we hopefully have enough in IPv6. So it's like a technology thing, and everyone needs to uh, get on board that technology. Oh, there's one more question. Oh, uh, yeah, there's one question. Just to build on what uh, Vivek said. Uh, China, there are two parts to Bitcoin mining, which is one is the computing power, uh, which requires m mining power, right? So second is the electricity cost to run the miners. So China, in both cases, has the lowest cost when it comes to buying technology for mining. And also the electricity cost is really, really low. So that is why Bitcoin mining is actually more profitable to do in China than in other countries. Okay. Uh, do we have any further last questions? Okay. So I think we can uh, wrap up this discussion. Thank you, Vivek, and thank you, Florian. Please give them a round of applause. We've